thing recording here. So Richard Wilson, um, he's the founder of the Family Office Club, the largest membership-based family office association with over 1,750 registered family office members and 25 live events per year. He helps implement discrete um, full balance sheet family office solutions for 100 million plus net worth families through his firm, uh, Semi Millionaire Advisors LLC. Um, Richard produces the Family Office Podcast and his website, familyoffices.com, is the most visited in the ultra wealthy family office industry. So, Richard, thanks again for joining us today. Um, so, um, are you uh, presenting a PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yeah, I can uh, share it on here so everyone can follow along here. There we go. All right, and do you have the question and answer box and chat box where you can see it? Um, yes. Okay, it excellent. There. Yep. All right, so I'm going to let you uh, take it here in just a second, and um, you have the time slots um, from 3.30 to 4.45. Usually uh, everybody takes questions towards the end right at 4 to uh, 4.45 in that last 15 minutes, but I will let you take from here, sir. Great. Thank you. And uh, can you confirm you can see the PowerPoint slide just fine now? Yep, I can see it. Great. Great. Awesome. Great. Well, uh, welcome everybody here uh, to this session. We're going to be talking about how to raise capital from, from family offices. And uh, the whole point here is to help you be more effective at raising capital from wealthier private investors, whether or not they have an actual formalized family office, because many of you may not even be familiar with the term. because It's a relatively new term. And many of the investors you might be working with perhaps should have a family office or they will in the next year or two. And there may or may, or may not have one right now. So to begin with, um, a family office is an ultra wealthy solution uh, for managing a portfolio of investments. And it could be a multifamily office, which means an organization that serves 15 or 20 or 50 different families, all worth seven to 10 million minimum, all the way up to 50 or 100 million plus. Uh, a single family office, however, is an individual has their own team. So if you sold your multifamily portfolio 10 years from now for $150 million, you might say, okay, I'll trust a, a private bank or multifamily office with say 60, 70 million of my assets, but then I want my own dedicated team and we're gonna do direct investments in only two areas, such as uh, stem cells, and maybe now instead of multifamily, you wanna go into self-storage or data centers, et cetera. Having that team internally can help you keep control and have full transparency. And the whole reason why the independent sponsor model has exploded in popularity in the past decade uh, is really because ultra wealthy investors, especially entrepreneurs, wanna remain in control of their wealth in control of their destiny. That's how they created their wealth. Uh, almost none of them got you know, lucky or won the lottery. So it's not in their nature to typically want to invest all their assets in a blind pool fund or just trust a private banker with them. So that's why the family office industry exists. And the more family offices are created, the more independent sponsors are gonna get funded. Uh, and the, both of these trends are in parallel. People wanting more control, more transparency. And you'll see, you've probably seen already in your relationships that those investors that are worth 10 to 15 million want more control and transparency than somebody worth one or 2 million. Uh, likewise, somebody worth 30 or 50 million or 100 million more valuable to work with. Sales cycle might be a little bit longer and also they want, might want a whole nother level of control or transparency. So we're gonna talk about some of those challenges and I'm also gonna talk about uh, in the first couple of slides, my perspective. So when I'm uh, providing advice and ideas later, you know where that's coming from. And I'm going to provide a lot of quotes and insights that come from investors that speak on stage at our family office club events and uh, investors that are my clients and a couple of investors that you might be familiar with uh, name wise already. So by the end of this presentation, hopefully you have some new uh, fresh ideas and how to apply it to your projects. So first off, uh, since I'm in the United States, at least uh, regardless of where you're listening to this from uh, as a little disclaimer, obviously, if you're in Singapore, uh, with a publicly traded vehicle, you're probably under different regulations than somebody in New York City with something that's registered at the SEC uh, to do a uh, general solicitation. So obviously, before you use any ideas here or anywhere in this event, you should uh, check with the Compliance Council to make sure you can. Uh, next, uh, our organization is called the Family Office Club. At the core, we have this community and a media platform. We own familyoffices.com capitalraising.com. We host 25 live events per year. We just had an event yesterday actually here in Miami. It was a capital raising workshop event. Um, and we've got about 6,500 professionals coming through our events each year and about 300 family offices speak on stage. 
Um, so we get a lot of new perspectives every year. So I've been doing this for, I started this 12 years ago. Uh, we have a 19 person team here in the Miami area and we've trained a lot of capital raisers. And what's interesting is that everyone is raising 25 million plus, $100 million plus a year in equity are doing many of the same things. Uh, and they're not doing what the people just getting started are doing, but everyone that's raising zero to one or 2 million a year or only friends and family money, they're all doing the same things as well, but they're not doing what these guys are doing up here. So I think that's interesting to note, and it's something that we've noticed again and again over the years, and I'm gonna point that out in a few slides here today, and a few things that you should definitely avoid doing uh, at all costs. The other perspective that we're bringing to the table is that I have an organization called Centimillionaire Advisors. Uh, the word centimillionaire uh, means $100 million plus net worth, and if somebody is worth $100 million plus, that means they typically need a lot of help with their direct investments. It typically means they're investing in commercial real estate uh, and that they are highly active in doing things directly themselves typically. Usually they have part of their own single family office in place as well at that point. I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but um, we have written the most popular, uh, most read book on the family office industry. Uh, we, we have centimillionaires.com and a bunch of free uh, giveaways there. Uh, if you're an ultra wealthy investor and want to follow up on any ideas there uh, to see how I could work together. But we work with families in all different industries, not just real estate families. The latest ones were a healthcare family we just signed up, speaking to a $200 million manufacturing family. Uh, we have families in fintech, et cetera. So we're not just exclusively real estate, but we can provide this view of the forest of the family office space. And that's the whole point of this presentation here today. Uh, the other point of view we have is running pitchdex.com, an investor relations marketing agency. We help people do their one pager, teaser, pitch deck, logo, one liner, website, investor targeting, et cetera, uh, all in one package. And we don't just make it look pretty. Uh, we know what investors are looking for. And we review about 200 pitch decks a year from Family Office Club members. Uh, it's free as part of their membership. And we have that perspective. So we see, for example, one insight from that is out of 295 pitch decks that we have reviewed of people actively raising capital, not just people thinking about doing it, two people had videos out of 295 pitch decks, zero of those had a video of the founder. Even something as simple as a one minute video that looks like what you see right here, explaining the strategy on site, walking through an asset, nobody is using video. It's like the whole industry is a decade behind the rest of the world on using technology like social media, or things like video or text message. And when we're on stage at our events, I've asked three times to a panels of five different investors, would you prefer if somebody had a video on their one pager or their pitch deck or website or not? And they said they would much prefer. They can see that your credibility, they can see whether the video is on site, they can see whether you can talk about your space, whether you're articulate, whether you're credible, uh, professional, whether you have expertise or not. Even if the video is just 90 seconds long, they said they would rather see one than not, yet absolutely nobody is doing that. So that's just one takeaway that uh, if for some reason you have to run real quick, hopefully you can at least run with that and start using video while working with investors right away because the most sophisticated are saying nobody is doing this and they see a ton of deal flow. So private investors who maybe aren't as sophisticated or formalized as a large family office that has a team of five or 10 or 20 investment professionals they're gonna see even less deal flow. That means you have less competition to win a mandate from them. The checks might be smaller, but it's gonna be that much more effective to use video because you can be assured that no one else is showing them a video and earning their trust that way. A lot of the ideas I'm gonna share in this PowerPoint are gonna help those of you moving from raising capital from private investors to raising capital from family offices, which can often mean moving from 25 to $75,000 checks to 200,000, 500,000 or a million dollar plus checks to do that, you're gonna to have to get some doors open where someone's gonna refer you over and hopefully that referral goes smoothly and they get a good first impression when they open your materials. Uh, you might also have to email a group that's local to you, local to an asset you're acquiring. They don't know you and you're coming in cold. You have to find a way to add value to them first and have the best first impressions. If they're seeing a lot of things, a lot of it looks the same after a while, uh, they get bored by what's average and they're really looking for an anomaly. They're not looking for average. They can find that all day long. Uh, so they really want to find something truly unique and compelling. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that over the last 12 years, uh, we've seen investors complain about the same things again and again and again. 
we've seen capital raisers get frustrated about similar things again and again, and you're going to see some of those themes uh, coming up here in the slides. At the end of the day, what I think everybody wants is an unfair advantage. And I found that you can get one by combining several very simple things. So first off, you should identify what you're doing and make it unique. If you're a multifamily independent sponsor and you describe yourself that way, you are not unique. Uh, you need to have a scope or a strategy or both that is something an investor has never heard before or they've been looking for and can't find or they're refreshed to hear or it solves a headache they have or something that's really, really dialed into the type of investor they are. For example, you could say we provide multifamily properties exclusively to dentists who have their own practice or we provide multifamily properties to law firm partners uh, along the East Coast, etc. Maybe you used to be a lawyer, maybe you used to be a dentist and now you're into multifamily. Whatever your background and strength is, dialing something in on geography, strategy, or the investor base is pretty critical. If you don't sound unique, you might as well just meditate and not even take action until you have something that is truly unique and compelling and then take massive action on that. Uh, another thing can provide you an unfair advantage is getting down a very compelling, concise one-liner on why people should open your email, call you back, take your meeting, go to the next page of your pitch deck, read your one pager, and then you can use that everywhere when you shake somebody's hand in a coffee, in a coffee line at an event, et cetera. So get your one-liner down, get your unique positioning down, figure out the exact investor you're going after, listen uh, more than you pitch when you actually get in front of investors. If you combine those simple things and having visual professional materials, you're gonna have a marked advantage against 90% of your competition because what everyone says is, oh, well, we raise capital from all types of investors. Like, yeah, well, that's great, but the words you need to use to convince an institution to invest, like an endowment fund, are night and day different than a individual who sees two deals a year because you met him at the golf course or he's your friend from college and family offices are in the middle. They're gonna have sophistication, see a lot of deals, and they'll be bored by something that you don't really dial in and get down to a single sentence. It costs nothing. So there's no reason not to do that. And I would bet that most people listening here haven't done that yet. Um, and there's no reason not to. Uh, also, I would mention that no one's gonna take your offering more professional than you take it yourself. So if you don't care enough to get it down to a one-liner on why you matter on planet earth to your target investors, why should they care enough to listen to you and then have to do that homework themselves? You should do that for them and boil it down to how exactly you are unique. The fact that you put 10% up in every deal, the fact that they're cash flowing deals, the fact that you target good demographics and GDP job growth, that means absolutely nothing to anyone who sees multifamily deals more than twice a year because every single human being in the multifamily space seems to say those exact same things. So you have to have something fresh and something new and something innovative and unique or something more focused that adds to your credibility so you can be seen as the person dominating that geographical space for that strategy. Uh, the last thing I'd say about this is that if you want to be taken seriously and show that you take your own venture seriously, then you should consider if you're raising $10 million, maybe invest 0.1% in the materials that make you look more professional. So I could do this recording right here uh, in a t-shirt and sweatpants. I could do it with a broken window behind me or a dirty wall, etc. Uh, what's the cost of having this professional appearance? What's the cost of shaving uh, and wearing a suit jacket, et cetera? It's almost nothing. And the same is with your materials. If you're raising $30 million, invest 0.1%. That's $30,000 and having everything be very professional. If you're investing $5 million and trying to raise that much, just invest $5,000. And you can look at it two ways. You're either going to raise the capital faster because you invested $5,000 out of $5 million or you can just raise $5 million and $5,000 and it costs you absolutely nothing. You just raised a little bit more to pay for those materials. There's no reason not to do this. I uh, see we've got uh, one question here. Uh, Richard said the audio uh, cut out a second ago. If you can let me know if it's better, uh, that would be great. If not, I'll use my other microphone. So thanks for letting me know if it's still cutting out or not. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the next slide here though. All right, so one huge mistake that a lot of investors make is that they, or a lot of people make when they're raising capital, is that they often do not recognize that investors are constantly busier than they possibly uh, can manage while trying to raise capital. 
So essentially, oh, I guess my uh, audio is cutting out. Let me uh, switch my mic in five seconds here. Hey, we should be good. It should be better now. Uh, so hopefully everyone can hear me fine. Uh, so the challenge is that a lot of people are raising capital, trying to move very quickly. They might be emailing 20, 30, 50 investors before hearing back from any. They might be excited when an investor replies to an inquiry uh, about a deal that they're working on. And so when an investor does engage, they, they might then call them right away, email them, text them, call them again the very next morning. And meanwhile, the investor has been on an airplane flight. They get off the airplane and they see in every channel possible that you've followed up four times. It makes it seem like you're the only investor who has gotten back to them. Or it seems like that nobody else is interested in your deal. Or it makes them think this is your first deal or that you're very desperate for it, or that they have tons of leverage on you in negotiating the fees. It communicates a whole bunch of bad things. And in short, it just shows you're relatively new uh, or perhaps you know, young in the industry, which obviously is not something that you want to portray. Uh, and I, what I, well, the reason I'm bringing this up is that almost everybody makes this mistake. And family offices complain about it again and again. Uh, so don't make that mistake, please. There's no reason to do it. It doesn't cost anything to be politely persistent and be patient. Just realize if you don't know how often to follow up, it depends on when the deal is closing, but at least give someone three business days at the very least. Even if you're closing in 15 or 20 days, you're going to blow up the whole deal if you try to rush it. Uh, otherwise, what you should do is maybe if it's just building a relationship for a potential future deal and not a real urgent situation, then I would give it a good 10, 10 days or 10 business days even so that you don't seem overly desperate or rushed. Another concept that's kind of a, a mindset that can be mistaken is, uh, you know, I've got a slide here if you're following along visually that shows a back to the future picture and it says roads, you know, where we're going, we don't need roads. Well, in the family office space, you do need roads, meaning that you need relationships to get things done. You need to build a relationship first. We see all the time that people new to raising capital run around at a conference and give everybody their flyer and say, hey, this is my deal, this is my deal, you have to look at my deal, it's got the best metrics you've ever seen, it has low risk, or if they want the true stamp of amateurism, they say there's no risk, it's the best deal you've ever seen. Uh, and it just makes investors just want to run the other direction, especially if you got, you got sweat on your brow and you're leaning right into their face and just like way overly excited. Uh, you know, they want nothing to do with you ever again, I promise. So, you know, don't be that guy. Um, but many people, even after raising capital for a little bit, emphasize the deal way too much with family offices. They want to know that you're committed to your craft, that you're excellent, that you have a true, compelling, unique approach, that you have a great strategy that's hopefully going to weather well, even in a downturn, that you have an excellent team, that everything is highly integrated in your team, that your strategy makes sense with your background, with your geography, with your fees, your structure, and that the whole context and trust around what you're doing just adds to the sense of high conviction. Trust and high conviction, commitment, excellence, you know, true expertise is so much more important than what the IRR of your deal is. And people get that completely backwards when they're starting to raise capital. I found that when you're raising capital, there are really three trust curves at play and they interact with each other. You don't need to move someone all the way up all three of these trust curves to get a deal done. Uh, but they are important and usually all three will be at play. So the first one is leadership. You need to have trust in who is running the team or the investor is not going to come into the deal. They need to know the members of the team and not only the founder, hopefully. But the more that they trust the founder and the longer they've known them, the higher that trust curve will be. That's why people start with friends and family money. The next trust curve is the industry. If they're investing in multifamily and they never have before, that's going to take some additional education, usually, unless they've known you for a decade, et cetera. But another trust curve is the individual opportunity. So they could not know how apartment building investing works at all. But if they live in the apartment building or they live right next door to it, or they drive by it every day on the way to work, they're more likely to invest, even if the trust is just in you and then where the deal is and that being a good area to invest. They don't even have to know how the apartment building investment space works, perhaps, and they might still invest. Obviously, if they're up all three of these curves, that's great. They're probably investing. Uh, somebody could be investing all the time in multifamily. That's going to help your situation, even if they're not local to the deal. Because if your deal is amazing and it underwrites very well and you have a very thorough data room walkthrough, 
numbers, good, good assumptions in your models, good answers to their due diligence questions and a unique strategy, all that combined is going to make them lean forward quickly and want to invest in what you're doing because they see so many deals that when something's unique, it really stands out against everything else in the background, which is just noise after a while. This is why you should first focus on people that have known you for a long time to raise capital then focus on people that are in the industry, always investing in the industry. You can do co-GP, joint ventures, find investors who invest in passive real estate investments all the time. And then focus on investors who are local to the deal that you're raising capital from. So you can go to family offices in that local area, family offices that focus on real estate, and then family offices that know you already, or private investors who are ultra wealthy and know you already. And if you go into meetings, where your lead is at ground zero on all three of these curves, just cancel the meeting uh, or just find a way to add value to them first without even trying to convert them to be an investor in the first year that you know them, because it's probably not going to happen or it's going to be a long educational road. The good news is out of all the niches on planet earth to be raising capital for multifamily is the easiest to educate somebody on. It's the opposite of doing some black box algorithmic hedge fund, you know, type model. It, nobody understands. Uh, so that is the good news. Um, it's not impossible to educate them on the industry. And if they are local to the asset, then you might be able to uh, get the deal done. But the point is, if you're based in San Diego, and the deal you're investing in is in Toronto, but the investor has never met, never met you before, and they're based in Singapore, you know, good luck getting that deal done. Uh, you should try to make it so most of the investors you're going to are already up one or two of these curves. And things are going to move faster and you'll get more investors closed into your deals. So I'm going to go through some quotes starting on the next slide, but here are some top complaints that we have heard literally hundreds of times over the last 120 conferences that we've hosted since 2007. The first, and these are complaints from investors. The first, everyone is busy and then they rush into meetings and few of them truly actually prepare and they just pitch the whole time. They don't get to know the family. They don't get to know the investor. They don't ask smart questions. They haven't done their homework before coming in. And they kind of have this expectation that they're just going to be able to fumble through the meeting. And the family office is like, what? We spent our time to meet with you and you don't even know who we are. You don't even know what we're doing. Like, why did we say yes to this meeting and who agreed to this meeting? This is a waste of our time, et cetera. Um, you should be adding genuine value, not just pitching the whole time and asking questions. So you can tell them the part of your pitch they actually care about versus the whole pitch. Uh, the next thing is to make sure you show up on time. Uh, showing up 45 minutes early is just as bad as showing up 10 minutes late. Uh, respect their time, be short, be concise, uh, and keep emails very short and to the point. I found that my most valuable phone calls usually last eight to 12 minutes. Sometimes we'll have an onboarding phone call with an ultra wealthy family who might be negotiating terms of a contract. It might need to be a longer phone call, but my most valuable phone calls of the week are always quick phone calls. The more valuable the person, the more that they just want to get it done, talk about the agenda of the call, knock it out, and then get off the line to the extent that I don't get on the phone with anyone that I don't have a scheduled call with. And I don't get on the phone with anyone where there's not an agenda to the phone call. And sometimes a member in the family office club will get upset and say, oh, I'm paying a couple hundred dollars a month for all these member benefits, but if I can't get, you know, 30 minutes or an hour of your time on the phone, Richard, then maybe I don't want to be a member anymore. And I say, I'm fine getting on the phone if there's an agenda for the call and it's something I could help with. But I don't know if you're about to pitch me an investment in a Zimbabwe mobile app or an apartment building in Panama City uh, or something that's going to be a complete waste of your time to pitch me on because I don't invest in Zimbabwe mobile apps, et cetera. So uh, you have to realize as much as possible to respect the investor's time and have an agenda for every interaction and send over materials ahead of time so that they can review things. And when you come in their office, they can ask you some smart questions and vice versa versus starting on page one of your pitch deck, which is slow motion death and just say, hey, I went to Wharton. I did this in 2007, this led in 2012 and walking through every slide of your deck is really not the way to be presenting to a family office. The last thing here about top complaints is to know your competition so that your energy is focused on where your, your unique capabilities are. There's a commercial real estate group uh, that I have a relationship with. They're doing a billion dollars a year in transactions. They're launching a investment firm and they came to me with what they thought was their unique uh, characteristics and they're not unique at all. Uh, I know 475 multifamily independent sponsors in the US alone 
Uh, we've got a, a directory of them that we work with through our uh, CRE lending uh, dot com division. And I can tell you that everybody is saying the same thing on a base level. So you really have to get it unique. All right, here's some quotes uh, from investors uh, and members of the family office club here. The first one here is from a $500 million plus family office that owns the Mall of America. They say, you have to keep your eyes open and investigate hunches and signs of a potential deal being available. One of our best deals came from a classified ad in the newspaper for a bank for sale. Uh, since then, after buying the bank, they've made it one of the most successful and largest banks in Canada. So you never know where you're gonna find a good multifamily deal. You never know where you're gonna find a deal in an unusual place, but by keeping your eyes open and being curious, uh, you might be able to make progress that others are not who are more closed-minded. We have a quick question here. Do you find many family offices are willing to be a JV investor or partner or co-sponsor? Um, or is a preference to be passive? Really good question because I try to bring this up when there's time and I think this is easy to mess up. If you go into investor meetings and you say, here are our terms, it's two and 20 or it's a 6% preferred return and then 30% carry after that, et cetera. Uh, then they might say, okay, well, interesting. And it might sound like what a lot of other people pitch them. But if you have a good strategy and you also approach it in an entrepreneurial way, and if they're an entrepreneurial family, or a real estate family that structures deal in, deals in a unique way, they might prefer to set it up as a debt transaction or partial debt, partial equity. They might prefer to be a co-GP and open some doors for you to help raise capital. They might do the equity portion if they can handle the debt part of the deal. And having that open mindset is really important. Sometimes they'll tell you what structure they want, but it's good to have a go-to debt and or co-GP equity structure in mind. So if you have to think on your feet, you're not just really, you know, drawing a blank or having to come up with things from scratch. Second quote here, we invest in very focused but boring asset classes that pay well and we have done 23 of those deals so far. This is a uh, family office club member that's jumped a billion dollars in assets under management in the last two years alone. And what they're saying here is they're very focused on things that are cash flowing in one area, one asset type, and because of that, they've grown a billion dollars in AUM. Third quote here, I think it's harder if you're a me too business or you're one of many. I think if you really have an innovative idea or you're first to market, there's no shortage of money. And this is Robert Herjavec uh, from Shark Tank, who many of you know, but he said this during one of the shows uh, and I wrote it down as a note because I, I saw this the night before one of our capital raising workshops. Uh, and I think it's always harder than you expect it to be when raising capital. And sometimes you think you have something unique and it doesn't sound unique or the uniqueness isn't compelling to the individual investor you happen to get in front of. But I do think that there's a kernel of truth in there that if you have a really unique concept, capital is going to be chasing you. So you have to keep pushing until you do have one. All right, this next slide is going to be on structures. So there's a picture of uh, Grant Cardone here who speaks at my uh, annual event. Typically we do it. Uh, we have 25 events a year. One of them is a thousand person event called the Thing We Office Super Summit. He usually speaks there for me. Um, so this first part here, I never lose my or never lose my money. I work way too hard to make it. And again, that was Grant Cardone. So that's basically just a mindset. Like he knows how to make money. Uh, he does over a hundred million dollars a year in revenue in his companies. So he doesn't need you to make him rich. He needs you to have something that's hard collateral behind it that's going to grow in value consistently and do well. It doesn't need you to 10 times as money or 20 times as money, et cetera. Second quote here, we like to joint venture with asset owners. Everyone is on the same team and we leverage our capital. This is from Sasha, who's closed a couple of deals through the Family Office Club events. Um, it wasn't Sasha, but this reminds me of another one where uh, there was a idea presented on stage and it was so unique that the principal of a family office who had just landed in his private jet in Nashville Heard about the idea, got back on his private jet, flew back to New York, and then met with the investment firm because their idea was that unique. That's the opposite of archiving your email with their thumb as they go walking towards the elevator because it looks like every other email they've gotten from every other multifamily independent sponsor on planet Earth. Uh, next quote here, uh, we charge no management, acquisition, or performance fees. We get an equity premium up front, and then we're in the deal with our investors for the duration. This is from one of the uh, family office club members that manages over a billion dollars. We raise 10% of the equity needed from a small group of investors with a 10% fee charge, put up 25% of the amount needed, 
and then JV Equity Partner, the rest of it at a 60-40 profit split. This is from an independent sponsor with 4,000 doors of apartment buildings to date. So essentially they are finding private equity firms that need to allocate capital to decent deals. They find the deal, they structure part of it, and then they kind of joint venture that with uh, big private equity firms that are investing in real estate and they know that their criteria is, so they're bringing that deal flow to them. Last one here, because I think structure is really important. Most people overlook it. Uh, same with fees. We charge a six to seven percent, six, seven, eight percent pref, uh, and then take 20, 25, 30 percent, and then 50 percent profits. And that is pretty much industry standard, quote unquote. So the point of this one is that uh, everyone tells me their fees are industry standard. I've had people who charge a 6% preferred return and take 50% of profits tell me that's industry standard. And I know others that say what they're doing is standard and they're doing the same preferred return and they're only taking 25% of profits. Both of those things can't be true. So you have to be careful on that and either not use that term or just ask yourself, you know, like one of our latest clients actually just last Friday, uh, through pitchdex.com, they said, oh, well, how about these fees? Doesn't that sound reasonable? And I said, yeah, but why would you want to be reasonable? Don't you want to be compelling? Don't you want to be exciting to invest in? The last thing you want to be is reasonable. Uh, you want something that's going to make someone lean forward and say, oh, well, that's a really aligned structure. That's excellent. That solves the problem we're always complaining about internally, et cetera. If you can, if you can charge above average fees, more power to you. But in theory, that should be when you're providing above average value, and that's what's going to convince family offices and sophisticated investors to invest. All right, so now we're going to talk about investor networks. Um, and let me see here. I think we've got a question real quick, though. How long does it usually take a new investor and multifamily to start working with family offices? So I'm guessing that you're saying um, if you're going to start syndicating your own deals uh, when you say that you're a new investor in the space uh, and that you're going to essentially become an independent sponsor or be the GP of a deal and try to find investors in the family office space. So I would try to start relationships early. Someone might want to get to know you for four months, nine months, even two years. They might want to see you get your first tiny deal done with 20, 50 units, your next one done with 120 units. You know, they might want to see some deals under your belt. Uh, and know that you're serious and real, et cetera, before they allocate, or they might be okay allocating a very small amount, see how you treat them, see how your reporting is, see how your follow-up is, and then they could grow that account with your firm. The trick would be just to wear that risk on the sleeve and not pretend like, like lots of people, they say, oh, well, these are industry standard fees. And it's even worse to say when your firm is not industry standard, you're a one man shop, you don't have a track record, you're not close to standard. So why would you have any fees that are close to standard? Um, more power to you, I guess, if you can charge standard fees without having uh, standard levels of kind of track record, credibility, you know, uh, balance sheet, et cetera. But I would have a more creative structure that takes some of the risk off the table, performance only fees, some of uh, first loss risk capital for yourself, something that makes it so you're putting up a larger percentage of the deal on your first couple deals to show confidence in what you're doing, something that de-risks it a bit for the investor. So I hope that helps. Feel free to keep on submitting questions as we go here. So we're going to talk about investor networks now. First off, um, there's a quote by Dan Sullivan, uh, who is a CEO of 130 person team that does probably, I don't know, 30 or 40 million a year in revenue. He says that the more focused your target market, the more valuable the opportunity. I couldn't agree with this more. At the Family Office Club, we're not trying to be experts in wealth management. Uh, when we advise investors at Centimillionaire Advisors and Centimillionaires.com, we're not trying to advise everyone on planet Earth. We're not competing with private banks. We're helping with direct investment portfolio construction with setting up and formalizing single family offices for investors. We're helping with originating deal flow for investors and designing family office solutions. And we don't do what wealth management firms do. We don't do what a multifamily office does, et cetera. So because we're so focused on that, we have people all the time that open doors for us because we're not competing against the 40,000 private bankers out there. And we're doing something very unique and focused that's performance-based. So if you can find the same niche, uh, for yourself, then that's going to allow you to grow faster. And if you're struggling to get deals raised, I would tighten the focus of what deals you do and tighten the focus of what investors you're trying to appeal to. If you're trying to appeal to everyone, you're going to appeal to nobody. Uh, the second quote here is from one of my early uh, stage mentors, Jeffrey Gittimer. He says, fortunately, life is unfair 
and everyone still prefers to do business with those they like and trust. And that's the good news. So in other words, everyone knows that it's an unfair playing field. Uh, they've scientifically proven that in most transactions and sales, the relationship matters more than the attributes of the deal. And I started out my whole presentation saying that everyone makes a mistake of thinking it's your IRR uh, of the deal that's gonna drive how much you bring in from investors. Uh, the quality of your deal matters a lot, but the quality of your relationship and the context of your credibility matters even more. Uh, the last quote here on this slide, uh, I have with less effort connected with more family offices taking my kids to the park where I live now versus when I tried to be out networking and making connections in Oregon. Uh, this is actually a quote for myself. I used to live in Portland, Oregon, where they basically pay you to leave the state if you're a successful business person. They don't like you making money there. Uh, I should stick to craft brews and uh, voting for new things that used to be illegal to be legal if you want to live in Oregon. So I'd left uh, like a good business person and came down to Florida where there's palm trees and low taxes and on accident now at a family barbecue, a birthday party, pushing my kid at the swings, I met somebody worth over $100 million dollars. That would never happen if I lived at the park all year long in Oregon. You would never meet somebody worth $100 million plus, I believe. So surround yourself, live in a place where it makes you motivated, it makes you healthier. We are around prospects, we are around the people you're going to be raising capital from, we are around the deals you're going to be doing so you can drive to the deal instead of flying across the country to it. So you're intimately familiar with what's developing in the city versus just thinking that Raleigh, North Carolina is a great place to invest, but you're based in San Diego and you know, you're just mostly hoping that's true off some data points that you looked up. Um, I would just uh, be where you are doing business. It sounds basic, but a lot of people don't do that. Also, you might say, oh, well, you know, that's, that's great, Richard, you're able to do that, but uh, you know, I'm starting out with nothing. Well, I started out with absolutely nothing. Uh, in my business, no debt, no partners, and bootstrapped it up to, you know, doing 5 million plus a year in revenue and 19 employees. So I know how that is. But if you're paying taxes in California, New York, Chicago, Oregon, et cetera, and you're paying a 9 to 13% state tax, that state is paying you to leave. And that difference in state taxes will pay for your rent wherever you go until your business grows from being in a more business friendly place. And then you can, you know, rent a better place or buy a place. So it turns into an investment investment instead of a cost if you live in a place that's smart for your business. And I found that out and we've tripled our business since moving here to Florida. All right, this next slide here is about getting attention. Managing attention and getting it is critical, obviously, in a busy world and busy inboxes, social media, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm gonna run through five quick quotes here. This first one is a $100 million plus net worth uh, single family office professional. He says, you have one sentence to get my attention. And he was dead serious about it because there's just so much coming into his inbox. So many people trying to get access to his checkbook and his time. Another one from an Intel corporate venture capital professional, Sanjeet. Uh, he said this at our San Francisco Private Investor Summit. He said, you have 15 seconds to get my attention. Uh, otherwise, you're gone. And he said that about voicemails. He just deletes the voicemail after 15 seconds. I know I get so many voicemails. Sometimes I do not have time to listen to them for three to four days at a time because if it's important, their phone number would already be in my phone or they know to email me and my voicemail literally says that. Number three here, the title of your public talk, publication, or book is so critical, you must spend an outsized amount of time getting it right. This is a quote from Brian Tracy, who again is one of my mentors. I've met him in person a few times. I was on his television show. He's been on my podcast. I interviewed Brian Tracy for 45 minutes just on this topic of raising capital based on all of the sales and leadership and time management knowledge. And you can listen to that, that audio interview for free if you want to. It's at familyoffices.com forward slash audio three. Uh, but in that, in that interview, he basically says the title of his book gets him hired for six figure contracts before anyone's even cracked open the book and read it, he'll get hired for things. Obviously, you want people to actually read your stuff to be amazed by the depth and the genuine insight and the generosity of your advice and the showing of your true expertise. Obviously, that should go without saying, but the title is going to change everything. If you have a book called Dancing in the Rain and it's about like getting through real estate during a recession, um, you know, uh, you could have a book cover that communicates that, et cetera, but why not call it the thing that you want to be seen as an expert in because you're missing that opportunity otherwise. Uh, quote four here. 
thought leadership is the holy grail of capital raising. This is a quote from Mona Marquat, who has raised uh, now over $10 billion. This quote was from two or three years ago when she had raised only $6 billion, but she's got a team of about 15 full-time capital raisers. So she does have that massive advantage, but she's raised capital for all types of investment managers. And she thinks that thought leadership is the holy grail of raising capital. So I, that's one of my favorite quotes of this whole presentation. Next quote here from another mentor of mine, uh, Evan Pagan, the headline or email or subject line of your communications has to hit your potential client between the eyes and pop out among a bunch of noise or you do not exist. So we found if you use their first name in the subject line of an email, or if you put their phone number in the subject line, say, hey, do you have a time, do you have time for a call at your, and then put their phone number in the subject line using your CRM or manually doing that from their business card, their response rates go through the roof. If you just use their first name, the response rate goes up, but adding the phone number in there, nobody ever sees their own phone number in the subject line, then you almost always get a response or at least a read. Check if we have any more questions up here. Uh, not right now, but feel free to submit them as you have them. All right, this next page is on pitching. So the first one here from Kevin Harrington, who invented the infomercial, has done over $5 billion worth of sales uh, for his clients and companies. Nothing turns off an investor more than someone coming in with a ridiculous valuation. I love this quote. It's one of my top three quotes of the entire day here because it's so true. Family offices, um, you know, I know that all, most of you are on the multifamily side, but if any of you also are raising capital for other things and the operating business side, this drive, drives investors even more crazy. So first off, investors don't want to invest in overpriced assets. If it is overpriced, you better just point out the elephant in the room and say, here's how we're going to, how we're going to add value boost NOI in a way that sounds clear and unique and is realistic and doesn't have a bunch of, uh, big assumptions that don't seem realistic. But if you come in and try to get, um, and you try to ask for way too much, then an investor will just go dark on you and you lose the chance to work with them. And investors really want to be long-term aligned with their partners. So they want to find ways to work together on many deals and have it be a great aligned relationship. So asking for way too much just because you think they're dumb money uh, or that they haven't done their homework or research is a dangerous way to go. The next quote here, most critical to build a re real relationship uh, as a human being. That's what's most critical. And this is from Sheila Driscoll uh, from the billion dollar plus uh, Driscoll strawberry family. She spoke at a couple of our events this last two years, but she said that, you know, just developing a real relationship and getting to know who someone is, is most important, more so than the details of your deal. And that's straight for her words, uh, word by word. Next quote here, identifying those who have liquidity events or are already investing in your space so you don't start at ground zero with their understanding is critical. So this is something related to the three trust curves we talked about. If you're starting at ground zero, you might stay there forever and not even get attention and not even get a reply, not even get a phone call or a meeting with most of the people you're approaching. You have to find some common ground to begin with. Most of us don't have the luxury of having lots of referrals coming in all the time. So it doesn't really help at conferences when people say, oh, well, if, you know, I get referred lots of deals. That's the ones I look at first. Well, that's great. For those getting referrals, but when you're getting started, you have to be more creative and find people that you have already things in common with or that already know your deal or local to the deal or know your space. Next quote here, if you can't come clean and tell investors how and why you failed, that raises a red flag. They need to see that you learned from it and came back stronger. I love this quote because it is a stamp of true amateurism when someone says there's very low risk or no risk. You just want to run the other direction. If scientifically proven as well, you're more influential if you point out what is not ideal, like what is not excellent and amazing about what you're doing. Like I can tell you right now, uh, we have something called the charter membership in the family office club. You know what we're not, we're not an investment banking firm. We're not placement agents. We're not going to go take your deck, take your deal and go call 400 investors for you, find your 17 investors and raise all the equity for you. That's not what we do. So you point out that negative thing first, because that's what everyone would really want at the end of the day. Uh, and we say what we do things that no one else does. We have capital raising workshops. We have familyofficedatabases.com. We have crelending.com. We have pitchdex.com. You know, we put together all your materials. We can give you great advice, et cetera. But you point out that negative thing and not only adds credibility, but just showing, for example, if you've done seven deals, which two deals went bad, what you learned from them and being honest and candid with that 
uh, I think really helps because it just shows you're a real human being and everyone knows that nothing always goes perfect. Nothing goes very, very well every time. And so if you pretend like it does, then people start to think you're a con man, you're not honest, you're not genuine, you're not authentic, et cetera. So I'll try to avoid that at all costs. Uh, this next slide is on due diligence. And we have a couple questions here I'm gonna answer first. Do many or most family offices have an allocation model that divides investable funds into strict investment alternative percentages? For example, 20% real estate, 30% stocks, et cetera. Um, yes and no. So uh, with over 20,000 family offices globally, there's obviously a lot of different ways to skin the cat. You know, families from Russia, Hong Kong, Eastern Europe, you know, it was just in Tel Aviv in the country of Georgia a couple of days ago. Families from Brazil are heavily commercial real estate allocated, even if they're managed by a private bank or one of the newer multifamily offices in that region, they're heavily in commercial real estate, uh, office parks and multifamily, some extent self-storage, uh, the top three areas that I see them in. Um, if you look at more Western family offices in the US and Western Europe, we've done a survey of 180 of them and I've seen that 75% of them have a formal allocation to cash flowing real estate assets or to, to real estate. Uh, and of those that have a formal allocation, it's making up on average 25% of their portfolio. But that may or may not be because they have a formal goal. So if you go to a multifamily office, they'll probably put you in one of three or one of four different kind of sleeves and risk profiles and they'll come up with a formula and try to stick to that. Multifamily offices might have opinions on that, put their clients into these buckets to make their life more efficient and make sure they're doing a good job respecting the risk levels of their clients. The truth is that a single family office who's entrepreneurial and has a balance sheet to do what they please and they can change their mind every quarter if they want to, they typically, in my experience, will have 40 to 70% diversified with a private bank or multifamily office or in different types of investment funds that track the broader market, they'll then typically have 25% or so into cash flow in real estate or real estate lending. And then put maybe just 10 or 20% into private operating businesses where they created their wealth, but they expect that what part of their assets to grow the fastest. Other people see it as the riskiest part of their portfolio, but that's where they see their wealth spiking up is through those investments where the real estate is supposed to be hard asset, grow nicely over time, be a nice tax advantage way of growing their wealth, while the liquid, uh, semi-liquid fund managers, stocks, bonds, equities, commodities, et cetera, is something they could tap into. If they wanna go heavy on a business opportunity or go heavy when the real estate goes down and the market collapses, et cetera, but they just expect that to kind of track the market and maybe get them a six to 12% return they're looking for maybe uh, anywhere from 10 to 22 percent IRR from real estate with hard collateral behind it and they're looking for excessive returns on the operating business side usually or just consistent returns where they can apply their passion and where they're most excited in business so uh, I hope that helps in answering the question all right so this next slide here on due diligence I keep asking questions and digging to find the source of value the core of the deal. Sometimes what someone knows is more valuable than what they can do for me. So this is from one of the smartest family office principals I've ever served. Um, he exited for well over 300 million in assets. And he realized that sometimes somebody would be very intelligent. Maybe they're great at finding a deal. Maybe they had a good head on their shoulders and a lot of experience. But sometimes he would find that what they actually would do on a deal was not rocket science. Finding the deal was hard, but what they did after close, he, he could handle with his team. So um, this can be tough. It might not be an ideal client for some of you listening to this, or you might have to be very creative in your structure because you should just know there's some family offices out there, especially those worth 500 million plus, a billion dollars plus, that you know want full control of the deal. So you have to find some way to defend it and say, well, no, you don't get to do that. So you're either in the deal, you know, in my structure or you're not, or it can be co-GP as long as you bring some value to the deal um, or have some structure that's so creative and performance-based, they're fine with that type of a fee structure. But just so everyone knows here listening, there's only 3,000 billionaires that have been able to be identified. The number is always higher than any of these statistics because if you're in Asia or Eastern Europe, your kids might be get kidnapped at your private school or 
uh, you know, uh, danger could come to your family or the government might confiscate your assets if somebody finds out you're ultra wealthy. But there's supposedly around 3,000 billionaires globally. There are 55,000 centimillionaires globally. These are people worth $100 million or more. And then there are 211,000 ultra wealthy individuals globally that are worth $30 million or more. And I don't know the numbers off my top of my head for worth seven to 10 million uh, or more, uh, but I know it's very high, obviously, uh, much, much higher than ultra wealthy. So the point is most people are not gonna be this level of a control freak where they say, well, I like your brain, I like this deal, but I wanna take it. So uh, you know, let me pay you for finding the deal and then we don't want to pay you for managing it. We can do that part. That's, that's a relatively straightforward uh, part of the, the process perhaps. So I just watch out for that with some families and just be ready for it. Uh, another thing on due diligence is something called the beer test uh, where, you know, I don't personally uh, drink myself, but I, I spoke to one multi-billion dollar uh, institutional investment consultant firm. Uh, and they said that after they have a few formal meetings, two or three in their office, they'll, they'll take someone out for a drink or two and see how much they drink, uh, see how they treat people, say, see what they start talking about, see if they start cussing all the time, see if they bring up a lawsuit or a divorce, see if they talk about their partner leaving the firm, see if they talk about how they're trading Bitcoin eight hours a day or what they really want to do with their life is do X or retire in six months or sell their company. They said a lot of things come out over drinks that never come up with informal due diligence. People let their guard down, and that's part of their formal due diligence process is an informal beer test. Next point here in due diligence, I don't believe I've ever invested in a deal where I haven't known the principal for years already. This is from Pierre DuPont from a $10 billion multifamily office. It can be pretty depressing if you're listening to this and saying, oh, I have to develop a relationship with a family office for years before they're gonna invest. Well, for some, yeah, that's going to be true. And if you're only in business for the next six months or the next few weeks, then you should just stop listening to this recording right now because all of these ideas are about how to be massively successful long-term with family offices. And you only need two to four a year or one to three a year to join you on top of your private investors and you could be doing very well. But family offices is a long-term, a medium-term game. It's not a short-term you know, I hope Richard says something on the next slide to help me raise this deal next week. Otherwise, you know, I don't like this family office thing. You know, you might as well, you know, go and listen to another realm of presentations right now. Last point on this slide was uh, from a multifamily office. They say, we look for the combination of traits of someone who is both humble and hungry. All right, now we're going to talk about emerging managers. So new investment firms that are trying to raise capital and get deals done with family offices. First off, there's a, a quote from a single family office here. It says, we like joint ventures with asset owners. Everyone's on the same team. So that mentality of co-GP or joint venture or systematic seed or anchor equity is something that a lot of entrepreneurial single family offices like. It's a lot of thing. It's something that a lot of real estate families like as well, uh, if you can bring it up. Here's another quote. We struggled to raise our first $4 million, and then we studied investor relations, capital raising strategies, and after that initial momentum, we raised our next $8 million in no time. This is from a very fast growing capital uh, manager, uh, and they're raising $100 million now. Uh, and I think they've already raised 40 million of that. Uh, and the point here was the first 4 million was a big struggle, and then they raised $8 million very quickly. And uh, they've been to some of our workshops and just a few of the ideas from our workshops, they said have uh, made all the difference in that. Next quote here, you can't charge fees as if you're the industry standard. If you're a boutique firm, you have to respect the risk the investor is taking. This is what we were talking about at the beginning of the presentation. Here's another quote. We took five family offices out to dinner after an event and one of them seated us with a $50 million investment allocation for our niche strategy. This is from a family office club member uh, as well. So if you're an emerging manager, one, one of the things besides focus that I think I want to communicate is that you should just start small and get started on deploying your strategy. It'll add to your credibility. So there was a, an oil and gas investment professional at our event in Chicago at a private investor summit, Chicago or Dallas, and uh, they were on stage and I didn't know they were going to say this, but I said, yeah, well, we tried to raise $30 million and we failed and we spent 10 months of our life doing it and no one would allocate the assets. They didn't believe us, didn't think we were credible enough, et cetera. Then uh, we decided to, he decided to 
do the smallest deal possible. He found a mineral rights deal that was $110,000. He put up $55,000 himself, raised $55,000 from six investors, got it done, got the returns for the investors. Nine months later, he did a $400,000 deal. The deal went okay. He did an $800,000 deal. The deal did very well for his investors. He then did a $3 million deal, then a $10 million deal, all spread out by nine months or a year. And now he's working on a $30 million deal. But he said he needed to grow his credibility first. He needed to build that track record. Now he can say he's on deal number five or six, and he has past investors to go to who will re-up in his next deal. I see so many people starting out, and they're trying to raise capital for a $20 million deal, and they've never raised capital before in their life. We had a PitchDex.com member who I literally said, I will not serve you because you just gave us a bunch of money to create materials for your green project. You've never raised capital before, and you're looking to raise $800 million, and he was a a capital raising placement agent. I said, no, I'm not even, like he had already paid us for the services. I said, I'm not even going to serve you on this. You need to go back to the drawing board and not be serving eight different people, raising capital for all different types of opportunities. They're going to require all different types of investors. Figure out what you're best to raise capital for. Figure out who's the most credible person you can raise capital for. Just focus on that and that type of investor and then come back and we'll create amazing materials for you. But otherwise, you're going to spend this money and you're never going to be a repeat client for us because you're going to go out of business and the client's going to fire you for not getting the capital raise. No one goes from raising zero to raising $800 million in their first year. I promise you. So if you're trying to do that right now, you know, please don't uh, and just start in a more realistic level. Um, I think that's it for this slide. And we've just got four slides left. Uh, if anyone else has questions, please feel free to submit them. Here's a uh, private investor and angel investor tips. One, uh, we made no progress for months, and then we connected with a single investor club that's resulted in 24 new clients in two months. Uh, I spoke with this individual yesterday who just got a $50 million investor uh, through our family office club, and he's actually up to 32 clients from that one referral source. Uh, so he's obviously happy. Uh, that doesn't always happen, but it just shows that if you can find a network of angel investors, private investors, et cetera, and do well in that network, things could go very well for you. Next part here, find a niche angel investor or industry group in your area or geographically uh, in your area and start one. So you could find a group that is, you know, focused on passive real estate investing in Chicago or a real estate professional networking group or a, a meetup group, a LinkedIn group, a Facebook group. Uh, many of you are part of them or you wouldn't be here uh, at the event today, listening to this and watching this, uh, so this might seem obvious, but tapping into angel investor groups that typically invest in operating businesses, a lot of those groups might not formally take real estate ideas in front of their group, but those same angel investors are investing in real estate deals. Uh, in the future, there's going to be more angel investing real estate groups out there. I'm sure of it. There's more of them starting up every year I see. Um, and you can always start one yourself if there's not one in your area, perhaps. Last part here, everyone has a deal to syndicate these days, but most haven't done their homework or put in the time to know their market enough to win over the informed and sophisticated investor. This comes from a Miami family office speaker. They're basically saying people are, you know, seemingly hawking stuff left and right, but they don't have a unique approach. It might not even be their own deal. They're not going to a unique investor set. They're not building a relationship first. Just like the last speaker, Henry, was saying, if you're going to be the GP of a deal, you need to actually be walking the property, know the deal, be involved with it intimately, not just be hawking random deals here. You need to be a licensed broker, usually, if you're doing that in some countries, including the United States. So I'll just be careful of that. Next page here is from $1 billion plus family offices. We've signed contracts with three or four of these. Uh, we have relationships with about 90 families worth a billion dollars plus, and we have uh, you know a couple dozen that speak at our events each year. Uh, before we uh, go over that, I'm going to answer the question here. I'm just trying to pull up where the question is. One second. This has been excellent. I'm glad you liked it. Uh, do you find family offices becoming more concerned about the market down cycle? If so, how are you seeing them mitigate going to cash? gold or lower leverage? Really good question. Um, I don't want this to be relevant to someone who listens to it five years from now too, but uh, what's interesting now in, in June, June 2019 is that starting two and a half, almost three years ago, 
everyone on stage started to talk about selling or being a net seller uh, and that they were cautiously optimistic. And everyone started saying within nine to 18 months, they think the market will go down. Well, they're still saying that two and a half years later, but what's changed is um, they are not saying the words, we are a net seller. They're just saying they're being very tough on the underwriting and picky because everyone's complaining about cap rates getting beaten down. And there's a few ways to view that. Uh, one is that if cap rates are at 5% and you know how to boost NOI, you'll be rewarded 20 times every dollar that drops to the bottom line on NOI. So if you have a great strategy for boosting NOI, you know, uh, then it could not be a bad thing that cap rates are low. Uh, the other thing is that some family offices have gone to debt more. And maybe before they only did uh, one debt deal a year, and now they might have that be a third or a fourth of their whole real estate allocation might be the debt side of things, which means they might only invest in companies where there's real estate collateral. It might mean that they only invest in opportunities where they're doing like hard money lending, um, uh, et cetera. But when there is hard collateral behind something, everybody feels more safe and comfortable. Um, I haven't seen too many say that they're investing in gold, but more invest in cash uh, and more are sitting on cash waiting for either a downturn or an opportunity they can't resist. So I was just on the phone with a family a couple of days ago who has been investing in Harlem, but they found a development property in Brooklyn that is at about $120 a square foot for development land and everything else they're seeing is $200 per square foot. Um, so they say, okay, well, that's pretty exciting. Uh, that seems like an anomaly. So they're considering doing that investment where before maybe families would try to be more fully allocated and they wouldn't like sitting on the cash. Now they feel like they're being smart having saying 15 to 22 percent cash versus maybe traditionally you know three to five percent cash uh et cetera those numbers would be different for every family obviously there's no recommended amount of cash for any one family without getting to know you uh billion dollar plus family office insights here's one from mark cuban uh many of you know who he is i've learned that usually the easier someone says something will be, the more likely my scam alert goes off. Nothing is ever guaranteed. The scammers tend to try to make you think they have a sure thing. When you hear that, run away. Couldn't agree more. When someone says something is very, very low risk or no risk, I know it's very high risk. Someone came up to me at one of our events. Uh, most of our members are not like this, but someone came up to me and said, oh, this has no risk. And they showed me a computer generated image of a piece of real estate. And I said, well, have you built even one of these resorts yet? And they said, no. I said, okay, well, uh, then you don't have a pilot study. And I said, oh, well, we have a computer generated pilot study. And I said, okay, well, then you don't. So there's tons of risks. There's operational risk, architecture, permits. You only raise part of the capital. You break ground. Now you can't raise a rest. There's counterparty capital raising risk. Uh, there's risk all over this thing. So you saying it has no risk. I just, you know, I had to be polite to her because she was a member of my own event and everyone starts somewhere and has to move up a learning curve. But I said, like, no, this is not, this is not going to work. I can't introduce you. I can't, you know, there's no way to like help you on this specific project really when you're framing it that way. So uh, don't, don't uh, state things as very, very low risk. Next part here, preserving values and acting in line with them matter more to most families worth $100 million plus. This is from Sylvia Benito uh, from GenSpring, which is a multi-billion dollar multifamily office who spoke at our family office super summit. And she's basically saying that your values matter more uh, than the investment uh, components of what you're offering. We talked about that before earlier as well. Uh, Marcus Lemonis, if you don't have emotion, you don't have passion, then you shouldn't be in business. This is why you should use video so people can see that you know what you're talking about, that you like what you do. Mitzi Purdue has spoken at several of our events from the Purdue Chicken family. Families must pass on their stories and values and that's what preserves the wealth. Very true. Uh, it's what keeps families from destroying each other and destroying their wealth legacy as well. So a couple golden threads and they tie together. I know we're running out of time. We just have 10 minutes left until I need to be done. If I need to be done sooner, please let me know via the chat and I'll, I'll take a look here. But otherwise I'll be done just a minute or two early and answer questions as we go. Uh, so some golden threads, I hear it over and over again. Investors look for long-term commitment, high conviction, high integrity, and the way you do one thing is the way they're gonna assume you do everything. Investors are not cheap. They wanna be aligned with you on value creation and fees. The more connected, informed, and sophisticated the investor, the better your deal has to be to win their attention. 
There will always be more competitors raising capital in every niche, but consistently, most doing so ignore fundamentals. They ignore the complaints of investors. They don't target investors of a certain type specifically, and they don't communicate clearly. Last one on this slide, do not chase excitement, build what is to come and there will be, and others will find you and get excited about you being ahead of the trend three to seven years from now, instead of chasing things with the herd. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for this, this slide on local lead generation strategies, uh, but we talk about it in our free book at capitalraising.com. If you wanna download that, it's an 80 page book on how to raise capital. Uh, but essentially, most of you are raising capital locally. You can use geographically uh, focused Facebook ads, Google AdWords, uh, LinkedIn. You can retarget people that have been to your website and only do social media advertising to them. You can upload 5,000 or 1,000 investor prospects, see who matches in Facebook and LinkedIn, and there might be 1,000 people you've already met with face-to-face, -face, and only social media drip on people that you know are real prospects and stay in front of them via social media websites if you don't want to try to appeal to random people on the internet via social media and you're too conservative to that. It can be a way to just keep in touch and build the relationships with people that you've met one time. You can also identify live real events going on at say the Ritz Carlton in Chicago on a certain date and have a Facebook ad go within a one mile marker of that conference, which might have 500 people attending and target your male or female demographic and age just in that area and turn it on when the event starts, turn it off when the event is over, and you can get access to some potential investors or joint venture partners that way. Another strategy is to look up title searches of all the assets that you would like to own and see who's on the title as the owner of that. So you don't have to go through the broker and you can go direct and either save a little bit on the brokerage fee or just get deals that haven't been listed yet. Uh, the whole goal here is to be first of mind and top of mind. You can get a better valuation, exclusive deal flow, see deal flow first, uh, if you really nail these local lead gen strategies. Our whole approach of the Family Office Club is to build an investor funnel. We do this to attract investors to the Family Office Club, to our events. We do it to attract ultra wealthy families to Centimillionaire, uh, centimillionaires.com and Centimillionaire Advisors, where we help them build direct investment uh, performance-based solutions. And we do it using the funnel if you're following along visually here. So a lot of people listen to our podcasts, read our articles, blog posts, less people consume our white papers and reports, less people read our books, uh, less people watch me speak live at an event, but then all of that funnels down to more meetings in person. So if you build this funnel and you build helpful, genuinely helpful content, like hopefully I've found this presentation to be, then it will bring people to you consistently and the type of content and how you title it and who it's helpful to specifically is gonna drive who ends up wanting to meet with you in person. So if you're not attracting the right people, you might not be putting out the right helpful content. And it's kind of a, a game of how to be most aggressively generous. Whoever is most generous in a niche is gonna attract more leads consistently over time. We've spent 12 years building our funnel here at the Family Office Club with familyoffices.com, capitalraising.com, uh, pitchdex.com, et cetera. And I can tell you this works for sure. Uh, we've generated over $20 million of revenue from this. We've signed agreements with over 27 families worth $100 million or more. We have 6,500 people a year coming through our events and it's all because of this funnel model. So whatever geography or type of real estate you're in, which I know is most likely multifamily if you're listening to this, I would just encourage you to build this funnel. We don't have time to talk about this for a full hour or a day uh, as we do at some of our workshops or in my book, but uh, it's definitely something to look into further. Uh, like I talked about before, a lot of our work is with clients doing their materials through pitchdex.com. And then also I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for their time. We're based on an island right outside the city of Miami, so about 10 minutes from downtown. And again, our website is familyoffices.com. We've got a free book there, we have a YouTube channel, we have a family office podcast. And our whole business model is just to give away more than all of our competitors combined in the space. Uh, so you can get an ROI off of some of our advice and ideas before ever needing to formally engage with us or pay any money to become a member of the family office club, et cetera, just to kind of de-risk that uh, relationship transaction between us. Uh, if no one else has any questions, that is it for my presentation today. I'll just wait another 10 seconds or 30 seconds here to see if any others come in. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much. And you did go down through all the Q&A boxes, is that correct? I was just going to yep. out. Okay. 
Excellent. So tons of resources there. Um, right on the screen right now, you have uh, Richard's contact information. Please reach out to them. You got four books, uh, good reading material. I know. Are any of these on Audible? Do you know? Uh, yes, our capital raising book is on Audible. Excellent. I'm a big Audible fan because I drive a lot. So double speed listening, try to get as much content as I can. Use that windshield time to your benefit. So great. I'm probably going to check some of those out myself. Uh, so Richard, thanks for being with us uh, today. And everyone, please go check out um, Richard. Email him if you have any questions um, and check out the books. And uh, any closing statements for you, Richard? No, no. I just thank you. Thank you for putting this together. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot more of these in the future. So I appreciate you guys being innovative enough to uh, organize this. And I think it's something that everyone who's listening or presenting at should take note of. I think it's a wave of what's to come, you know, event wise. Yeah. And like I said, everybody that's attending, even if we don't have people right now, these videos are available for download. And that's where we're seeing a lot of our content is, you know, after these are rendered and sent out, you know, you can watch them at your leisure, you don't have to travel, plane tickets and everything else. So, and you're right. still in the network. You can see the participant list, you can message people. So it's, it's great. So thank you for being a part of it and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Thank you, Brandon. Take care. All right, everybody, we are heading into our final session of the day. Um, it will be with John Jacobus, and he will be joining us at 5 p.m., so stay tuned. It's right around the corner, just a couple minutes away, like I said, uh, just a little under, about 18 minutes away. So please join us back in this room. In the meantime, if you have not registered for the next summit, please do so. It's on sale, $97 for the ticket right now. That's the cheapest it will ever be next mfin.com go to the podcast as well post a review and take a screenshot of that send it to stacy at multifamilyinvestornation.com and don't forget about the fundraiser we're doing today this is not something we do this is something we never do and but we believe in this and so we are want you to take part in this um take some of that um, money that you've made in multifamily and go support um this uh, gofundme for a uh, child adoption for Whitney sewell and please do that right now while we're waiting for the next episode. We'll see you in just a few minutes.